you look at it and while we're growing in Pennsylvania, if you want to sell your product anywhere else, you have, you're at the mercy, not just of the federal regulations, but other states. You know, you have states like Ohio, I believe, uh, banned smokable hemp flour, Texas. You know, you're, you're at the mercy of extraterritorial leaders. Um, and I don't know what you can really do to prepare other than have a backup plan. I think the, the biggest thing that anyone should always be prepared for, because it's that thing that every season you hear at the end of the season is I can't sell my crop now, or what am I going to do with my crop? And it's just really making sure that before you put the seeds in the ground, you have like two or three backup plans. That's Jason Holly, a business owner and hemp grower at Hempsylvania, a hemp company in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock. So on today's show, we'll talk to Jason about Hempsylvania and how his experience in the tobacco industry informs his hemp operation. We'll talk about compost tea and hemp as an animal feed. But before we get to that, we'll have another one of our Fiberside Chats, this time with Brianna Kilcullen, the founder of Enact, a company that uses hemp fiber to make high-quality bath towels, just one of the hundreds of thousands of end uses for industrial hemp. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Hemp Depot, where they're offering feminized high CBD Boax and Cherry HD seeds, seedlings, and clones perfected over five years of iteration and testing. Hemp Depot stands behind what they sell, offering 50% financing and a THC guarantee against your crop going hot. So whether you're a first-time grower or a veteran, Hemp Depot is here for you. Call 844-436-7234 or go online at cbdseedco.com. Okay, so we're going to have another one of our fiber side chats, this time with an entrepreneur from Jacksonville, Florida, by the name of Brianna Kilcullen, whose company, Enact, is making bath towels from hemp fibers. Brianna Kilcullen, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Could you introduce yourself for us, please? Sure. Thanks for having me, Eric. Uh, My name is Brianna Kilcullen. I am the founder of Enact. Enact is short for Enact. So we want to inspire people to take simple acts to create impact each time they use our product. And our act was bringing to life a hemp-based towel um, made out of 55% hemp, 45% organic cotton that we believe is better for all people and the planet. Okay. Um, Why did you choose hemp? What is it about this material that um, attracted you to it? I chose hemp uh, more so from my, because of my background working in textiles and being exposed to conventional cotton and synthetics, uh, synthetic fibers such as polyester, rayon, nylon. And so for me, I just saw this incredibly negative impact that these fibers that we use and wear every day have on the planet. And I was just always looking for natural fibers that had performance features that I was looking for in my textiles. And when I stumbled upon hemp, I was just completely enamored with the way it was grown and the impact it had, but also on its uh, performance features of being biostatic, meaning it resists the growth of bacteria due to its molecular structure. And it just made complete sense that we would uh, reintroduce this fiber back into society and we would want to uh, be using it um, and wearing it every day. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the the negative impacts of those synthetic fibers and cotton? Sure. So there's a great documentary. It's called The True Cost um, that I highly recommend um, anyone interested in knowing about the textile industry watch because it shows so conventional cotton um, farming is really largely run by Monsanto. I know this is the farming podcast, so I know I hope I know a lot of people probably um, are familiar familiar with Monsanto, so I won't go into depth. But essentially, there's a lot of um, essential uh, schemes that are that are set up that put farmers in situations in which they are having to purchase seeds. Um, they're having to purchase insecticides and pesticides, and they're having to do that on an annual basis and get stuck financially. And not only that, but it's also um, ruining the soil. And so they're just constantly having to 
try to get the same quality and, and output that they get maybe the first year or two from um, working with uh, conventional cotton and um, working with all of the different um, you know resources that are provided. And then it just slowly starts to deteriorate. And so I've actually met farmers in India, um, not the farmer, oh, I met the farmers, but I met um, families of farmers who have committed suicide. India has one of the largest suicide rates um, because of the cotton uh, farming industry there. So that was really impactful for me um, from a natural fiber perspective of seeing like there was gaps that needed to happen. I mean, or there was gaps in our system that needed to be addressed. And then from a synthetic side, it's really because these resources are finite. And that is um, what I find detrimental is that, you know, we're projecting uh, population growth and, you know, we want to sell to this, but we have a limited amount of those resources. And not only that, but when we are complete or when we're, uh, when products, when people are done with them, they're not, we're not designing for end of life. So these products are very difficult to break down and they end up uh, a lot of times being thrown into our landfills, which then um, emit toxful, toxic emissions, uh, which then contribute to climate change. So those were the main reasons um, that really stuck with me. And when did you start um, designing and making these Enact towels? I had the idea in August 2017, so almost three years ago. Mm-hmm. And it really came from my own personal problem. I was frustrated with the current towels that we have on the market. We have these very thick plush towels. And I was living near the beach in San Diego. I didn't have, (laughs) excuse me, a washer or dryer. And my towels just were picking up this gross smell. They weren't drying quickly. I was having to constantly go to the laundromat. And I really was like, hmm, well, I'm going, like, I want a hemp towel and this is how I want it. And so I went on and the mark um, online to find it and I saw that no one was doing it. And so that was really where it all started was designing a towel for my own personal problem with the expectation that other people had that problem too. Okay. And um, it's just kind of evolved um, from there of I've never went to design school. So I basically would get uh, buy all of the towels and start picking and pulling together the towels that the type of uh, texture, the weave, the design that were something that I wanted. And that was how the designing process evolved. And you said it's a a blend of hemp and cotton. Why did you have to do a blend? Right. So when I initially started out, I wanted it to be 100% hemp. Um, But then there was two main factors. One, the cost, um, because there is so little supply of hemp, the price is much higher. And I wanted to ensure that we could compete with a regular, uh, just be able to compete in the towel market. So I didn't want to outprice us Mm -hmm. and not be able to sell the product and then, you know, be able to one day have the price be lowered um, because there would be more supply supply once people saw the demand. That was the first thing. The second thing was that we just don't really have the infrastructure and the the technology yet. because we've invested so much in cotton as a fiber. Hmm. So there is still, you know, the, the weight of the hemp and the type of um, weave that you create just isn't comparable with, um, without it being blended. So those were the two main factors, hmm. performance and cost. Okay. Uh, but in the future, it could be possible, you know, with advanced technology to create an, an all hemp towel? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think that the textile industry has so many possibilities and including how we innovate with hemp. Um, But we just haven't focused a lot on the, we will focus mostly on CBD, right? As opposed to other ways. Yeah. Here in the States, it's all about CBD. There is, you know, growing um, fiber industry, but yeah, it's small, but um, hopefully we're on the, on the path to change that. So where do you source your hemp? So we source from China. That's where pretty much all hemp fiber comes from right now. Um, so you can get yarn and have it manufactured in other places. But anyone who's making a content claim with hemp as a fiber is most likely all coming from China. Hmm. 
Do you plan to continue sourcing it there or would you source it from the U.S. if the supply um, was available? I would happily source it from the U.S. I believe, you know, with Enact, uh, we do, we have been growing globally. So my vision is that we're able to grow locally to the markets and sell them, uh, whether that is here or elsewhere. But since we are based here and um, that is our number one focus, uh, I did reach out to town manufacturers. There are some factories here. And unfortunately, uh, they just weren't interested in investing in hemp and had certain, a lot of them run on wholesale. Um, so having a new startup brand and designing, they weren't interested. And I know there are some people who talk about that they can do hemp fiber, but the biggest thing that I just want to share is that providing a sample is so critical. And perhaps maybe if we were a larger brand, we could be able to say like, we can do this R and D and invest in it. But being a startup where we believe our opportunity is creating the market, we don't have the capability or the capital, um, Mm -hmm to really, you know, work side by side with someone to say, let's get this seed and see what's happened and follow all of it. Um, which is why, you know, we're doing podcasts and doing things to get the word out so that people who do have that, those resources can do that. But absolutely without, um, hesitation, I would love to do it. I just haven't seen anyone be able to do, to provide something that we could use at this point in time. What are some of the other challenges that you faced being a, a startup in this hemp space? Um, you know, ever well, one of the biggest ones is just all of the negative stigma with, that comes with cannabis um, and hemp. And so there's a lot of times where we don't even really sometimes get to talk about the towel or even um, share who we are because people are just stuck on hemp. And so it's like a 30-minute education of okay, no, this is what it is. This is what's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They make the jokes about smoking the towel. Yes. My yeah. dad actually has, when we first were trying to come up with the name, he's like, we just call it high and dry. I'm like, dad, we can't <laughs> play to that. He's like, no, it's great. Like he has all these things and he like thinks it's hilarious. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. Cause like people you're feeding into it. We right. have to like break it. But that's a huge challenge. And so the lack of education to the customer on that front. And so, um, you know, a lot of people aren't looking, might be looking for a sustainable towel, might be looking for a towel that has our performance features, but they're never going to Google hemp towel because of they're already thinking, am I Googling, you know, a towel made out of drugs? Like, what is this? Um, so that's a huge challenge. Right. Yeah. There's a, a guy that I've interviewed a couple of times on the show. He's also in Florida. Um, Bruce Michael Dietzen, he's made. Oh sports- yeah, I know him. Oh, you know him, yeah, and yeah, I he do, gets yeah. that that same joke all the time. Can you smoke the car? Yeah. And it's got to be so <laughs> frustrating. It's like, no, you're missing the point. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we spoke on a panel uh, last year that it was uh, Florida's first inaugural hemp conference in oh, Orlando. Mm-hmm. Um, so we spoke on it, you know, from a okay, everyone's focused on CBD, but what are the other end uses and um, yeah, so it's, it was at, li- at least a, a, like a educated audience. So we didn't get peppered with those questions, but right. if you like remove yourself from the hemp industry, it's like, oh, here we are again. <laughs> right. Yeah. When I started doing the show, I guess in 2018, that was one of my initial questions. Like, does that stigma matter? Does the marijuana stigma matter? And y- it does just because of that educational barrier. You know, like in reality, no, it, it doesn't matter because it's a manufactured stigma. They they invented it. They they change people's perception. And now everyone has to deal with getting over that. But yeah, it's um, frustrating. It is. And that's why I was really adamant that we didn't include hemp in our branding. And we show, and this is, you know, what I share with everyone is that you lead with talking about its performance features and like how you're solving these problems as opposed to just leading with hemp because you're just going to fight. You're going to add one more thing on your plate. Um, Obviously you don't want to deceive anybody (laughs) um, and just be like, take all of this. And then, Oh, surprise, it's hemp. But I think that um, it, you just, you have to be really careful. Um, And I think until 
there is more top down or however it would come about education um, around the differences, then it's just, you know, don't add to your plate. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, how is the pandemic affecting your business? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, so when we were planning, we were going to have this huge launch party in Jacksonville where we're based. And I woke up in the morning and that was uh, when the borders had started to close and things were really starting to go in lockdown. And I just knew that it just wasn't going to be good. And mm. so I immediately canceled our launch party. So we had this huge party with like a bunch of media contacts we had um, reached out to and it was going to be like, boom, and then go to NOCO and we were going to, you know, hit the ground running right. as a um, like trade shows, conventions were here. Like this is us. Like, cause we did, I did a Kickstarter last year and that was how we were able to finance our first round of inventory and go to market. And so I have this, like had this inventory, um, remaining from our first bulk order after the Kickstarter orders were fulfilled. But I was like, okay, cool. Like now we have this great runway for growth where we can just kind of figure out the right formula that makes sense for us and, and where we want to be. And, um, I just evaporated overnight and I just was like, oh boy. And I think I just took like a weekend of silence where I just, Step back and really thought, you know, what, where do we go from here? And what does this look like? And so it was hard, but now I, I'm really grateful. Um, we're actually growing. I think people are now looking for um, products that perform the way that ours perform. They're looking for brands that are making a difference that they can feel good about. And, um, you know, we kind of dodged a bullet in the sense that we're now forced to figure out how to be 100% digital and right. online. And so it was like a little bit of a fear of mine, um, but it forced me to face it uh, without having to do the trade show circuit. And so I'm grateful. So I feel like any of these things are really, you know, just how you want to, how you decide to, to look at it. And so I think it's a blessing, but we're doing well, thankfully. So good. Yeah. Attitude is, is always so important. Um, getting back to hemp in China. So it's my understanding that the redding process in China is sort of chemical based. Um, mm -hmm. can you talk a bit about that and how does that sort of fall into your idea for sustainability? Sure. So I haven't, I've, I traveled to China in August, July of last year. And I wanted to visit each component of the supply chain to understand the processing and mm -hmm. see it firsthand because it's just been my experience. That's how I've learned. And there are so much, there's so many, um, you know, things that you'll hear about it, but it's until you see it that I feel like you can really speak to it and understand it. So that being said, I'll be transparent that I never, I didn't see the redding. I got all the way to the yarn. Um, I was, but the harvest was, we had, was going to be a couple weeks later. Okay. Um, I've spoken to a couple of people who are hemp manufacturers and it's just really hard. It's, it's kind of like, you know, saying, Hey, like, I love your podcast, but like, can you tell me about all the things you, you know, are uncomfortable about it and like <laughs> share it. Right. You're like, I don't. So like, those are my sources of, you know, of who I would be asking. And right. so I think there is like a very um, kind of fine line that you have to, to walk. And so um, I have read different reports, but I just haven't personally seen it to understand it. So I wouldn't want to share that. But I think that there is so much innovation that just could happen in general um, in the processing. But because of the lack of supply, I just really don't have a good benchmark to, to look and compare that to. Um, so where are your towels available? Are they in stores or is this something you, you can only buy online? You can buy online um, at enact.com. We also um, haven't partnered with any larger uh, chains at this point. Um, we've had some offers from some pretty big uh, retail brands but I want to really 
be able to grow um, organically so that we don't, you know, kind of lose who we are. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're in Jack in the South and Jacksonville, we're in several spot like boutique retailers. Um, We're actually in a a boutique hotel right now, a couple of yoga studios. So we have like a really interesting opportunity to be in a lot of different channels um, where towels exist. Um, but the best way to, to reach us is um, at anact.com, and we also do wholesale as well. Okay, and that's anact.com. Correct. Cool. Is there anything else you would like our listeners to know about either um, your business or hemp in general? The only thing I can say is we get hit up so often with people um, who have ideas and want to do different things and. I used to spend a lot of time like connecting and because I was like, this is so cool. You know, that's a great idea. Let's see what we can do. But I think the best way that you can support is by getting the market going and, um, and, and doing like your piece of the pie, wherever that looks, you know? So if you want to grow, but you're not able to yet because you don't see the market then helping like support, brands that are um advocating for that and have a product that can help get you there help get us all there is awesome also you know just continuing to educate and um you know as we're going into um like this past weekend we had the protest here on behalf of george floyd and um, black lives matter and this week is hemp history week so something that um i really would love to see and and what we're also advocating for is how do we bring in people who have been marginalized because of the cannabis industry and and create social equity that way. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I will often uh, bring this up with listeners. It's like, what responsibility does the new hemp industry have for that, that social injustice that's been happening for, you know, generations now? You know, it seems like there's a lot of rich white guys making money (laughs) when there's a lot of, you know, just regular people of color just put in jail and marginalized and, you know, families decimated. And so I think that's something that everybody needs to be thinking about. Exactly. And, you know, there's um, like we've tried to really change how we discuss because it's so it was great to say, okay, you know, the hemp flag or the U.S. flag was made out of hemp fiber. Um, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, they owned hemp farms because it was this great way to show this intrinsic connection to the U.S. history. Mm -hmm. But now we're trying to like really push past it and say, okay, they owned the farm, but they weren't the actual farmers. Who were those farmers? And then it brings up the conversation of um, people who were enslaved and who have continued to not be able to reap the benefits um, from this crop. And so that is something I just feel really passionate about. And um, yeah, to your point, like, you know, there's seems to be with any new industry, a certain group of people that kind of get to jump in and take advantage of it. But I think the real opportunity with hemp, because so many of our infrastructures for these industries have left um, this country, is that how do we talk about bringing them back, but including the people Mm -hmm. who started them. And I think that that's one of the most beautiful things that hemp provides all of us. So um, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, there's many opportunities to to build something brand new and inclusive. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Brianna, it's been great talking to you. Thank you for your time today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for creating this space to talk about these um, really important issues. These are important issues. Hemp is an important issue. So there's this famous quote from an Italian philosopher by the name of Antonio Gramsci. You've probably heard it before. It goes like this. The old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. And now is the time of monsters. Oh boy, that seems to sum up the world right now, doesn't it? Oi, such a strange place planet earth is in the year 2020 but i believe that there's a bright spot in all of this chaos and it's the hemp industry 
this plant, the community surrounding it, this will bring healing to this fractured world, right? That is my sincere hope anyway, and that is why I continue on this journey of education and illumination. And I thank you for joining me on this journey. Anyway, enough philosophizing. Let's get to the next interview. Here's Jason Holly from Hempsylvania. Jason Holly, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. Could you introduce yourself for us, please? I'm Jason Holly. I'm the president of Hempsylvania Incorporated, uh, located in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. And i um, been doing uh, growing industrial hemp now for a few years, both in Pennsylvania and Colorado, and uh, started the, the endeavor here in 2019. Uh, Hempsylvania went official and looking forward to uh, this season and uh, talking uh, with you today about some of the, the interesting things that we see coming up with the uh, the hemp. So what's the nature of the business? Obviously, you grow hemp in Pennsylvania, but you know, what's the business model? Um, our model is really, we're a small scale farming operation. We're, we're farming ourselves and really have been focused on not so much the farming aspect or the, um, the regulatory process because it's been so fluid. We've really just been focusing on building up our, our, our brand position in terms of uh, finding the right products to fit the right slots and then kind of almost backwards engineering our growing and our, our operations around uh, the product development, which is a little bit you know, different than some other people might be doing it where they're, they're starting out and moving forwards and we're kind of working from the, the backwards um, side of things just because we, we understood at the beginning that this industry was going to take a lot of time to really evolve and, you know, kind of figure out what pathways um, in terms of distribution are going to be the, the, the most relevant to the hemp industry and making sure that whenever we go into, you know, go and get cultivating something or growing something, not only do we know, you know, what it's going to end up as a final product, but also making sure that we're able to maintain all the things that consumers want in their products, which would be consistency, quality, and safety. Hmm. So it's really just been from, from anything we've been really letting the industry take us to where it needs to go, as opposed to trying to build something that would be, you know, much more difficult to, to move around, so to speak, if the regulations were to change. Okay. Well, give me an example of a product that you came up with and then sort of reverse engineered the growing. Well, I, I mean, my background is, and this is something that you probably you didn't know is I came from the, the tobacco industry, the premium cigar industry. And um, I've been working in that industry for 14 years. Um, was recently handling the marketing for the largest uh, white labeler for Altria, um, a company in the Dominican Republic that makes all the black and milds and uh, Marlboros for everywhere, but the United States. Hmm. And um, through that experience learned, you know, kind of the, the big tobacco side of things, but also on the premium, you know, the, the cigar side, we see hemp as something that's going to, you know, disrupt tobacco in a way on the smokable side. And um, hemp gars, for example, would be one product. Um, we bought the domain hemp gar and hempgars.com probably back in 2018. That was hemp so. bar? Like, What's that? Hemp bar? Spell that for me. Oh, sure. Hemp gar. Like kind of like a portmanteau of the word hemp and cigar. So oh, okay. H-E-M-P-E-A-R. If you, you know, Google it now, oh, you'll okay. start seeing people refer to you know, like a, a hemp style cigar where sure. the, the filler would be, you know, hemp flour using either a tobacco outer wrapper or any other kind of outer wrapper you can use. Hmm. Um, that was the one thing that really happened that kind of threw a loop for us, maybe that other hemp companies didn't experience is being that we're more tobacco centric with my, my experience has been the tobacco industry, the FDA regulations that came about um, in terms of substantial equivalence and the pre-market tobacco application uh, pathways they really changed um, you know, the way we would want to do things because uh, it's really difficult now to put a, a new product on the market that involves tobacco. Mm. So that's, that was another consideration that's led us to really crawl, walk, run before really trying to get into that, you know, rolling hemp and putting it on shelves because there are those FDA considerations that we have to take, you know, take into mind. Hmm. So you do have hemp bars out there? Hemp bars, we, we've been prototyping. And like I said, the, the big issue has been, you know, there's a couple of different things that from the, the smokable flower side of things that I, I've heard other people talk about on your podcast as well. Is that, you know, when it comes to the, to the 0.3 THC threshold, that is on that finished product. And when you're using flower, um, you know, 
it's very difficult to homogenize a flower. Hmm. Um, so you're going to have issues with testing in terms of compliance with flower until the genetics really were caught up to where they need to be to be able to go and pack, you know, 15 grams of, you say, uh, you know, hemp flower and be sure that you're going to be compliant with your 0.3 percentage. Right. That was one big issue. That's just been something that um, I think that's why you see a lot of people, especially a lot of the big chains uh, unwilling to get into some of the smokable side is because they're concerned about, you know, when you're using flour, it's much more different, different and difficult to test uh, than when you're using like a liquid or, you know, like a salve or anything mm -hmm. else. So mm -hmm. I think the the concept of finished flour products and the regulations um, make it a little bit more of a daunting product paradigm to, to like dive into because you're, you know, you're, you're, when you're blending flour together, you have to, in the end, come down to that, that compliance issue at point three. That's just something you don't face in cigars. Right. So how, how do you sit for this year? You, you feel good about your genetics and your compliance? I think we, we, we actually, you know, this year is going to be a great year for us to be able to take the, the, the product to the market because we're going to be growing a significant amount of THC free, high CBG uh, flour. Hmm. So we, we were lucky enough to get our, our hands on Tesoro uh, genetics, uh, brought the Panacaya strain in from uh, the University of Seville in Spain. And it's been testing anywhere from 14 to 18% on the cannabigeridol, uh, the CBG content with absolutely zero detectable THC. Wow. Okay. Well, let's talk about your farming operation. Can you describe sort of the lay of the land up there in Luzerne? Yeah, I mean, we, we have this season, we have two farms, um, our total acreage of about 25 acres between the two of them. Um, we farm completely organically. One of our fields is certified organic. The other field we're actually uh, certifying this season. It was a dormant uh, uh, dairy farm for about 10 years and they hadn't grown anything on it. We, we rented it from them and uh, went in and started work on the infrastructure and, and going to uh, have them certified organic. Um, we really go in and use, we, um, we don't really cover crop per se, but you know, we, we drip lining everything. Um, we, we, we cultivate a little bit differently than some other people do. And a lot of that comes that, um, my, my partner in Pennsylvania, uh, comes from, uh, uh, Boulder, Colorado and has a, an operation out of there has been farming for about seven years. So a lot of the methods and, and some of the, the things that he's run into, we we're able to kind of engineer that into our growing operation out here to avoid some of that. Can you share, that, you know, can you share some of those differences in, in uh, cultivation well, practices? Sure. I mean, like just the, in general, we don't, you know, we don't use anything other than very, I mean, everything's natural product wise. So, I mean, we use a compost tea recipe that is the backbone of our growing operation and it really avoids us having to use anything else from the conventional side of things that, that would be, you know, an amendment or a, an intervention for you know pests, molds, funguses, things like that. Our compost tea um, that we pump through uh, does a really good job. Um, you know, we do some foliar spraying with it. We do. Mm. We um, I'd say the things that we do a little bit differently. They, I mean, super cropping, just things during during the growing season. You know, going through on plant maintenance, um, just making sure that we're getting the most out of what we have in the ground and not leaving it all to nature. Um, I'd say the hand care that we try and put into the plant, you know, each plant, make sure it's, we, we, we do the, the math and figure out each plant's going to get probably about four or five minutes uh, of personal attention throughout the season. Hmm. So when you, you know, you roll up the acreage and you roll up the plant count and, you know, you're talking about, you know, maybe 50, 60,000 plants, it all adds up into the man hours. So it's really getting the crew out there that we have training them, making sure that they understand, you know, what our end goal is and then just providing them with the, you know, some of the, the old tricks, the old growers methods that, you know, we've been able to migrate out from the West coast and, and just making sure that our crops are, are really looked at daily and we're very proactive. Um, it's a lot easier to, to prevent something than it is to cure something when you're mm. out in the agricultural sphere. Right. <laughs> um, the compost tea, can you explain that system? Like how big are the batches? What are you sure. mixing them in? What, what are your inputs into that? Yeah, we, I mean, we do an aerated compost tea, so it's a nice mixture of, you know, you got your, your, your molasses and your biochar and your, your, your different, you know, your inoculant, um, like worm castings. We, we aerate it. Um, we try not to keep it 
um, from getting too warm so it doesn't kill off some of that, that good bacteria that we're seeking to get out there that gets in there and aerates the roots. So, I mean, we, um, we do really large batches. Uh, we're using at least 400 gallon uh, at a time, you know, containers in our batches. Um, and we're, we're putting a good bit out there. So, you know, always keeping it brewing the entire season and ready to apply it um, heavier if needed, if, we're, you know, if some issue, you know, brings itself. Otherwise, it's, it's just there as part of our, our regular, um, you know, regular feed programming. Okay. And then where do you source the input material? All over. Um, everything's Omri. You know, we want to make mm-hmm. sure that because we're organic on the one field and we're, we're going to be organic on the other, we're, we use everything, making sure that we're, we're following all the, the protocols of the organic program. But we try and source everything from Pennsylvania. Uh, first, I know we were dealing with Fertrells, um out of the Danville area. Uh, mm-hmm. We get a lot of, I know we get fish from them, some other stuff from them. There's some great suppliers. Um, now we're just starting to explore some Pennsylvania mushroom growing facilities to get, you know, uh, triaxial loads of mushroom soil tilled in uh, just before we plant. You know, we're, we're always just trying to build up the, the permaculture, sure. add to our fields and, and, you know, as much as we can. Um couple of different questions there. Um, sure. Are you able to recycle any of the plant material into your compost tea at the end of the season? You know, we didn't do that last season. Um, it's funny, I was just playing around with some, I have some stocks uh, left over from last year that were just, you know, left out to ret and to see, you know, what the time and weather did to them. And the durability of, of this plant is just blows my mind on a constant basis. Yeah. It, it's just how, how it holds up even after, you know, we're talking about seven or eight months uh, of nature's elements being outside. And, and um, the idea of maybe chipping it, we did run through, you know, some hemp stocks through a chipper, uh, like a chipper shredder, and it, sure. it made really nice, nice material. If that's something that we could actually um, go ahead and do, I, I'll be honest with you, we're, we're trying to stay away from that because we're really hopeful that in the next couple of years, we can start using some of that material to feed uh, animals and right. we'd really like to you know we're waiting basically for avco um to to signal that that they've approved you know hemp in the diet of of, of um animals nice again and yeah. we can start doing that that's where we really think there's going to be a lot of you know a lot of progress both in the you know the poultry the and the uh, pork and the beef industries uh, in terms of feed yeah so would you be um would it be an easy sort of pivot for you to get you know, go from CBG production into like grain production for poultry feed? I know. I don't know that it would be something we would necessarily produce. Um, Mm -hmm. We're not set up for that, for that level of production. And it probably would, it would, it would create such a drain on resources to go into that direction that we'd want to partner with someone who's got a good industrial footing, you know, that's already been doing a thousand plus acres or has meal pivots and someone that can really go out there and, and, and do that large volume um, because the, the amount of material you're going to need to feed animals, I mean, it's, you were, you were talking, you know, thousands and thousands of acres yeah. of, of industrial size, you know, style, style growing to be able to, to get the pelletized and the, the hemp seed cakes, mm-hmm. all the things that need to be created for that, that industry. Um, what other issues are you thinking about that you think maybe other hemp farmers should also be thinking about? Like what, what issues do you see coming your way or what are you, what are you dealing with now? I mean, I think the, the constant issue, just the one that's, that's so difficult is, is regulatory because you look at it and while we're growing in Pennsylvania, if you want to sell your product anywhere else, you have, you're at the mercy, not just of the federal regulations, but other states. You know, you have states like Ohio, I believe, uh, banned smokable hemp flour. Texas, I think, is banning smokable hemp flour right now. Indiana, too, is trying so, to. Right? In, exactly. So, you know, you're, you're at the mercy of extraterritorial leaders. Um, and I don't know what you can really do to prepare other than have a backup plan or, you know, just really be ready to. I think the, the biggest thing that anyone should always be prepared for, because it's that thing that every season you hear at the end of the season is, I can't sell my crop now, or what am I going to do with my crop? And it's just really making sure that before you put the seeds in the ground, you have like two or three backup plans because it's never, you know, it seems like it's always the case that it's, it's going to either the first case in the fall through or there's something's going to happen. And I think um, that's the one thing people, they come to, to they come into the, to growing hemp and they realize at the end of the year, they either have to take it all down and they don't have the labor or they don't have a place to put it or they can't finish it. And they get, you know, they get stuck into a mold scenario and it's just, something that I hate seeing because, you know, people work really hard to go and, and, 
you know, cultivate. And then at the end, instead of having a, you know, a dream for their hard work, they're left with a, with a headache. And it's just, mm-hmm. it's awful. Yeah. I've heard a lot of those kind of stories, you know, this, this past spring, a lot of people still sitting on last year's crop. Yeah. I think we're, we're just waiting for the regulatory things to work themselves out so that right now, I, you know, though I liken it to the fact that, you know, the faucet's not even really turned on. There's just drips right now for the most part um, in terms of the CBD industry. You know, and that's the really thing is when you break it down, it's like you have people going for, for CBD, you have people going for industrial aspects of hemp, you have smokable hemp flour. Now you have all these other novel cannabinoids like CBG or CBC. And you're going to see, I think genetics in the end is the, is the key to everything with regulations just behind. But in the end, Genetics are going to be the things that makes, you know, growing more efficient, extracting more efficient. You know, when you get into these THC vari- free variants now, you eliminate having to do any of those separations past what are using chromatography or, mm-hmm. you know, trying to do spinning band distillate. It's just going to eliminate a lot of those, those pinches that were there or those extra steps. And I think that's just genetics really are the thing that take time. You know, you can't, you can't rush genetics. You can rush regulations. You can rush just about every other aspect, but genetics, it just takes time. It takes time. Because you need to, you know, you got to breed out the, the issues and, and back cross and, and you're talking, you know, two, three years on a, on a good genetics product to, to get something of semblance of, of having, you know, consistency. Do you have a breeding program up there or you're, you're outsourcing your genetics? We currently have an in-house program going that was out of state and in Arizona, and we'll be moving into Pennsylvania um, this season. Um, we can't make anything public yet, but we are in talks with um, uh, a well-known doctor from one of the, the, the major universities in the state that's uh, big into the hemp program, and we're looking to work with him on some smokable genetics, you know, specifically for growing in Pennsylvania. How about your processing facility? Can you describe what that's like up there? Well, so last year we kind of went and did a little bit of a, of a makeshift setup and we, um, we were lucky to get out unscathed for this season. We're going to be building something more permanent, um, that'll allow us to, to, um, you know, do things more ergonomically than last year. It's the best way to put it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, um, really focusing on, like I said, for what the style we do and being that the bulk, you know, we're looking for smokable flour, obviously not everything smokable. So there's extractable stuff that we have to segment out. Um, last year we, we flash froze everything, um, that we were going to use for smoking grade and, uh, save that for uh, hydrocarbon extract for live resin. Hmm. So that's something that this year we'd probably, you know, be doing the same thing with the, with the, uh, the high CBG strain you know, uh, quickly segmenting out the smokable part from the uh, extractable part, getting it flash frozen on the field, um, which is really important. You know, the, the terpene loss is pretty significant um, the moment that you cut the, the plant from the, you know, the ground. So right. you're losing terpenes every, you know, every minute basically as they're evaporating. So once you get the, the plant frozen though, it basically locks everything in. And um, how quickly are we- you getting the plants frozen after harvest? Within an hour. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, depending on the labor points, when we were taking a field down, last year we had the, the truck right at the, you know, right at the field and just bisecting the, the plants, cutting the tops off and, um, you know, taking the bombs and putting them right into the freezer. Hmm. Cool. So what other product lines do you have? Um, you know, Hempsylvania is going to stay focused on craft artisanal stuff um we're like right now we're really focusing on and not going into areas that are going to like necessarily get us in trouble like i said till the till the fda standards come out you know a lot of our beverage line products we want to be able to do um just have that same that 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 kind of a you know pinch there um because of the fact that it's not necessarily going to be able to slide under the dietary health and supplementation act so that's what we're really focused on right now is things that are actionable for that you know, that don't include the, the, um, the, the DSHA, but I think, um, it's just a wait and see. I mean, we don't really want to rush a product out to market until the market's ready to receive it either yeah. is the other concept. And, you know, I've seen a lot of, I've seen hit or miss, you know, some of the mass market hemp product you see, you talk to gas station owners, you talk to convenience store owners and they tell you there's just not a lot of demand yet. And it's, you know, it's just, I think the lack of education out there on the consumer side or, the lack of standards out there as an industry 
are two things that, you know, people are unsure what they're taking and the safety aspect. So I think as that gets worked out, um, you're going to see a lot more, you know, a lot more products be shelf ready and then and willing to be able to go out and get behind a product like that and not, you know, see it as a risk. And right now it's just, it's pretty risky in taking a product and putting it out on the market. Do you have sort of like a long-term plan, you know, like, can you take us out 10 years? Sure. I mean, listen, I, I, I would say that the backbone of Hemsylvania was that two or three years ago, um, Granger and I, we really sat down and, and that's my, my partner from Colorado. And we, we figured out where we thought the industry could go in different pathways mm-hmm. and started locking in, you know, domain names or IP around those brands. So I'll be honest with you. I'm really excited about the concept of animals being able to include hemp back in their diet like they did you know, 70 and 80 years ago in Pennsylvania. It was very, you know, very common hemp feed um, in the in the agricultural industry. Oh, for um, thousands of years, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's silly that it's not back in. So, you know, we own we own hempseedcake.com and I think we own grass-fed, the real grass-fed meat is a brand that we, we really want to push. I think that could have some fun. Um, really, I think feeding animals is really something, you know, you're only as good as what you eat. And, and ultimately with animals in our supply chain, if we can have healthier, happier animals, um, then we can be healthier and happier. And I think there's a lot of um, unnecessary things that are, are being done to feed animals right now that could be, you know, a lot of things can be helped out by, by getting some hemp back in their diet. Not a, not a whole hemp diet, but, you know, a good part of their diet. Um, do you think the hemp industry has any responsibility towards social justice. And what I mean here is, you know, the war on drugs sort of decimated millions of, you know, families, people of color, while Mm -hmm. now you see, you know, rich white dudes getting richer from this. Like, where's the responsibility there? Yeah, no, listen, I think as a society, we have, you know, as, as a goal, we should at least be striving to there's no doubt that over the past 50 or 60 years, especially the criminal justice system um, really did its toll uh, on, disproportionately on, on minorities uh, when it came to especially marijuana of all drugs. And, it, you know, you would think that now would be an opportunity to kind of right some of the wrongs with that, with some with implementing some kind of, um, you know, I wouldn't say like, a, you know, I'm trying to think of what what kind of program you'd want to call it, but I mean, I don't see anything that's been done to try and encourage disadvantaged individuals from getting into the game. And that's one thing. In fact, I'll tell you straight up, there was a regulation in our hemp, our own Pennsylvania regulations this year that I would say disadvantages, um, you know, decidedly more, more of a, an urban uh, type of, this was the acreage I limit. Yeah, right? yeah, it's, it's silly. You, yeah. The, the, the indoor, of all. Hmm. And, and you can tell, you can bet yourself right there. That's, you know, there was no minimums in the years past. Um, and I, and I understand what the PDA goes through in terms of licensure and they do a great job, you know, whether it's Sarah or just the job that Russ Redding's done as a secretary, mm-hmm. they do a fantastic job, but charge more. You know what I'm saying? If it's, if it's a difficult thing for them to do because they don't want everyone putting in for a permit for five plants for their backyard, charge more. You know what I mean? That's the way you can do it. And it still allow people who don't maybe have, you know, a 2000 square foot greenhouse sitting around or an acre in the backyard um, to be able to plant, you know, and that's, that's, that was one thing there that, that very, you know, it kind of struck me as, well, if you live in the city of Philadelphia or the city of Pittsburgh, where are you going to find an acre or a 2000 square foot green, you know, greenhouse? Right. Right. Space you know, is already not, limited. Not realistic. Yeah. So, and I think that's one of those things where it's it's keeping people from being able to get into it and maybe grow their own, you know, five, mm-hmm. ten plants and have their own little supply of, of product. And I don't know if it was meant by design just to preclude that. Um, like I said, if it's all about diminishing the workload for the, the hardworking people at the Department of Ag, then just charge a premium for a permit that small. You know what I mean? Just so that it keeps people from just putting in for them just to, just to have them. Right. But at least allow that access to it. So they've done a great job with uh, the way the program has changed from, you know, two years ago to now. I mean, even the, the online process was super smooth. And, you know, with everything going on with COVID-19, I was impressed to be able to get our, our permits back as quick as we did from, um, from PDA this year. We had temporary authorizations. 
um, okay. you know, pretty, pretty quick time. So it was it went really smooth. I, they did a great job. Good. Yeah. Cheers to those guys. Um, I have some numbers from them for this year. Um, as of a couple of days ago, there were 623 applications. Um, they approved 560 of them. And I guess about 10% of those were for processors. So that's much more than last year. You know, I think last year there was maybe right around 400 permits. Yeah. yeah. And I so, think the high three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's a significant bump up. Um, that's good. I mean, I, I was, I was undecided on it. I didn't know if a lot of people were going to be, you know, leery about getting into it because they heard of stories of people not being able to sell their crop last yeah. year. Yeah. That's and what I, I thought. I thought it'd be much lower. Yeah. That's, it's impressive. That's a good thing though, because I mean, we, you know, we want the industry to flourish when you're named hemp Sylvania, <laughs> you want nothing more than to see as much hemp being grown in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, because that in the end, um, it obviously, serves our name right. And it's going to serve, I think, the Commonwealth, right? I think it's a great agricultural commodity that if we manage it the right way, can give some people options in the future. Jason Holly from Hempsylvania, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, sir. And just like that, we come to an end. So this was our 88th full episode. If we were miles per hour and in a DeLorean, we'd be back to the future right now. I'm not sure what that means. But anyway, thank you for listening to today's show. Got some fun stuff lined up for you over the next couple of weeks. Uh, next week, I believe we'll be talking to the the leadership chair of the Pennsylvania Hemp Steering Committee. So that's exciting. Tune in next week. Find out who that is. Actually, if you listened to the show a couple of weeks ago, you'll, you'll know who it is. Anyway, uh, who am I? I am Eric Harlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Don't take my word for it. Go out and pick yourself up a copy. Check us out online at LancasterFarming.com. Check us out on Instagram at LF Podcast Hemp. As always, you can drop me a line, send it to podcast at LancasterFarming.com or call and leave me a message, 717-721-4462. All right, uh, until next time, I will see you in the newspaper. Episode 88 the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2020 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Eric Harlock. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow. Industrial hemp.